Well, friends, it's very good indeed to be with you. The invitation to be with you um, came to me from Bishop Philip, my predecessor. Um, and I hope he won't mind too much uh, if I take an opportunity to say here what I have been saying in Sheffield regularly over the past 18 months, and that is that, and this will surprise none of you, Bishop Philip has been a model of Christian grace and generosity to me over the course of the past 18 months, a constant encouragement uh, and support in the midst of a most peculiar set of circumstances and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to say that in his hearing. <laughs> but although the invitation came from Bishop Philip, um, I have a hunch, I don't know this for a fact, uh, that um, it might have been the Bishop of Lancaster who put him up to it. Um, in which case, if this session doesn't go well, you can take it out uh, on Bishop Jill. Um, I know that over the last two days, you've been thinking about incarnation um, and atonement, and I've been asked to introduce the theme um, of future hope, um, and that's what I'll try and do. Um, but since incarnation and atonement focus on the person and work of Jesus, I'm interpreting the theme as the resurrection of Jesus and future hope. And since I know that in the course of 2019, you will have a particular focus on discipleship um, in the Diocese of Blackburn, I think I could equally take um, as a title, Embodying Hope as Jesus uh, disciples. I'm intending to speak for about 45 um, minutes um, and then I'll ask you to talk to one another uh, for a bit and then I think somebody will field some um, opportunity for uh, Q&A and I'll be happy to attempt to um, answer questions or receive your comments. Um, but I might by then be equally happy if what you want to do is push off for the worship um, at five o'clock so uh, we don't have to stretch the session out. And I'm really grateful to be asked to speak about hope because there is plenty enough in the world to say nothing of in the church to engender despair. And it's no bad thing for us to spend a little while this afternoon pondering afresh together why we, um, the people of Jesus, uh, can be people of hope and bearers of hope uh, to the world. How, how can we uh, believe it, live it, um, share it? And I'm going to speak quite personally about my own faith, about what gives me hope, um, about the Bible and how I've come to read it, um, about the way I've come to anticipate our ultimate destiny and the ultimate destiny of all creation. Um, I want to speak about the hope I believe Jesus holds out to us of that great day when the kingdom of God will come. Um, a few years ago, my wife Cathy and I were on holiday near Bordeaux uh, in France in July. Um, it was an absolutely stunningly beautiful evening, and we were wandering through a vineyard as the sun began to set. It was one of those moments which, if you could bottle it, um, you would, and we were both overwhelmed. Cathy's response was to burst into tears, and I asked her what was the matter, and she said, I'm sad because one day we are all going to die. And I said, oh, but that very thought fills me with the most immense hope. Now, I promise you I'm not usually so dismiss dismissive of somebody else's distress and <laughs> least of all the distress of my nearest and dearest. But as a matter of fact, my own response was just as instinctive um, as Cathy's. The thought that we're all going to die doesn't make me sad. It genuinely doesn't. Instead, it brings into sharp focus the thing that gets me out of bed uh, each morning, the thing that energizes my ministry and gives a sense of purpose to my life. And that is my hope that one day the kingdom of God will come. And I want to suggest 
that Jesus' own vision of God's coming kingdom was an embodied hope, and that his own bodily resurrection offers a paradigm of God's kingdom so that those of us who share his vision and proclaim his resurrection can ourselves therefore embody hope. Don't worry if that sounds convoluted at this point. I think I can explain what I mean. But my argument is that Jesus' own vision of God's coming kingdom is an embodied hope, an embodied hope set forth, as it were, in paradigm in his resurrection, and that those of us who share his vision can therefore ourselves embody hope. We really can believe it, live it, share it. I want to make three preliminary points, first of all. Um, the first is to introduce this theological technical term. I expect many of you will know this word every bit as well as I do, but others may not. And since I'm going to use it quite a lot, I thought I should at least try to explain it. The word is eschatology, and it means simply the study of the last things, the study of the end. So to speak, as I will do about biblical eschatology, is to speak of what the Bible has to say about the final destiny, not just of every single human being, but of all creation. Where is the universe going? Where will it end? Can we be hopeful about that? Because obviously, if we know that the ultimate story has a happy ending, then that can help us to remain hopeful when our own circumstances get difficult in the meantime. That's the first thing, eschatology. The second thing is just to stress that important as I believe biblical eschatology to be, you do have to handle it with care. A famous female theologian in the 1990s, Sally McFaig, wrote an important book pointing out that all theology is in fact metaphorical because it is God talk. Theology is the attempt to speak about God in ways that make sense to humans, but God is not a human. We humans live in time and space, and our language, our whole rationality, is really only capable of making sense of the stuff that exists within time and space, which God does not. Insofar as God is eternal, God might encounter any one of us within time, at any given moment, on any day, any hour, and because God transcends time, God is outside time, and insofar as God is infinite, God might encounter any one of us within space, at any place, here or there, but God himself transcends space and is outside space. That means God is outside our description and beyond the limits of our language. And that means that even the truest thing that I can think to say about God, such as God is love, is in fact relative and provisional and contingent because all three of those words, God and is, and love are human words fit for describing human experience, and God is not human. This is all the more important where biblical eschatology is concerned, because biblical eschatology is by definition looking at the point where space and time come to an end and are swallowed up in eternity and infinity. That is just bound to explode the ordinary categories of our thinking and speaking. But we have to try. We have to try to put into our inadequate human words what we believe lies in store for us beyond time and space, what we hope for beyond our experience of this life. So bear with me if at any point your brain hurts. It should do. And the last preliminary point I want to make is to acknowledge that not all of you will share my own theological convictions. To some of you, I suspect my views will seem quaintly conservative. I take the miracles of Jesus in the gospel at face value. I believe in the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Indeed, this may make parts of this afternoon quite an exercise in patience for some of you. The bodily resurrection of Jesus has become for me a starting point, a premise, a platform for my hope, and not a conclusion. But if by any chance the things I say um, this afternoon are new to you and things that you want to pursue further, 
uh, then let me recommend two titles by Tom Wright, one a short booklet, the other an accessible book. The booklet, the Grove booklet, is called New Heavens and New Earth, The Biblical Picture of Christian Hope. And the book is called Surprised by Hope. They're both excellent. They're both on the bookstore. And I think I'm right that the book is available this afternoon at one pound off. <laughs> you're spoiled. You're really spoiled. So then a question, um, first of all. When you think about it at all, I wonder what you imagine your final destination to be. Assuming you have a sense of our eternal destiny, do you think it's just for humans? Do you have any sense that the entire universe has a destination? What purpose might God have ultimately for creation? It's not a trick question. But I find most Christians aren't very clear about our destiny beyond perhaps the assumption that Christians, and maybe more than Christians, maybe more than humans, will go to heaven when we die. And here's the funny thing. Although the belief that we, or at least some of us, will go to heaven when we die is very widespread and is thoroughly embedded in our hymn books in particular, in truth, it owes more to Platonic philosophy than it does to Christian theology. Honestly, it's true. Most Christians don't bat an eyelid when, for example, in Wesley's great hymn, Love Divine or Love's Excelling, which I value, they reach the line, till in heaven we take our place or in his equally fabulous composition, Forth in thy name, O Lord, I go, the line, and closely walk with thee to heaven. Most of us don't experience any qualms at all. It sounds so Christian, so mainstream, so taken for granted as orthodox, and it isn't. So let me lay my cards on the table this is the most controversial thing I shall say all afternoon, so I might as well get it over with. I don't believe I'm going to heaven when I die, and I don't believe you are either. What's more, I don't believe the Bible promises that any of us will. The plain fact is that the phrase, go to heaven, is not one you will find anywhere in Scripture. Not once. It's not there in the teaching of Jesus, and it's not there in the teaching of Paul. It's not there in the New Testament, and it's not there in the Old. Scripture simply does not say that we will go to heaven when we die. Instead, it holds out to us a vision, a hope, altogether more glorious the hope that the kingdom of God will come, bringing with it the recreation of the heavens and the earth, the redemption and the regeneration of all things, where the dead will be raised to new life and the Lord will dwell with his people forever. The whole of what God created, the entire cosmos, the universe, he is now redeeming. And the whole of what God is now redeeming, he will finally glorify. Because God the Trinity is faithful as creator, redeemer, and glorifier. But please bear with me, because um, pastorally, um, some of you may otherwise be um, at this point distressed. Um, hear this. Meanwhile, as we wait for that great day when God's kingdom will come, our loved ones in Christ are safe. They are already with the Lord. They have already entered in to glory. That's the language of the Bible. It's only the shorthand phrase, going to heaven, that is so unhelpful, not the idea that the faithful departed are already at peace, utterly and eternally safe in the presence of God. I'm not asking anyone to surrender that hope. And you may think, well, then it's not important, is it? 
So what if we use the phrase, go to heaven, to describe the ultimate destiny of believers, even if the Bible doesn't use that phrase? What does it matter? Well, I want to suggest that it matters very much. I've come to the view that the language of going to heaven when we die is not just lazy, it's unhealthy. It encourages an inappropriate individualism when the, hum when the Bible speaks in terms of humans, it encourages a low view of our physicality as if our ultimate desti destiny is for our souls to float off to some ethereal realm when in fact our bodies matter very much. And it encourages a low view of the cosmos as if God's plan of salvation would have less scope than his original creation with the inevitable result that Christians have been less concerned than we should be with the future of our planet. In a nutshell, what I want to say to you this afternoon is this. By all means, let us recognize that any theology of eternity is bound to be metaphorical. But if we are going to use metaphors, let us use the metaphors of the Bible and not the metaphors of Platonic philosophy because the eschatology of Jesus and the prophets offers a much more embodied hope. So, if the Bible does not teach that we go to heaven when we die, what does it teach about what lies in store for us beyond death? If our ultimate destiny is not to go to heaven, what is it? That's what I want to explore uh, in the remaining time, and I want to do it by taking a close look at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25, because the surprising thing is that what Scripture does teach isn't difficult to find. Our true hope is right there, right under our noses. It's just that most of us don't see it. <coughs> I'll tell you what it reminds me of. About 40 years ago, when I was a student, I used to do a lot of hitchhiking. It was safer in those days than it is now. And on one occasion, I was travelling to visit a student friend who lived in Barnoldswick, or Barlick, as it's known by the locals, which I gather is technically in the Diocese of Leeds. Is that right? Although it's in Lancashire. I didn't know that was possible. Anyway, this was in the days long before mobile phones, uh, never mind sat-nav. So when I arrived in the town, uh, because I'd never been to his house before, I just got my last lift to drop me near a phone box, and from there I called my friend's house for final directions. His mother answered the phone, and so that she could provide me with directions, she asked me where I was. I said, I don't know exactly. So she said, what can you see from the phone box? And I looked out through the glass panes of the phone box and I said, a bus shelter and a post office and a little park with swings in a slide. And she said, oh yes, I think I know where you must be. Is there a bench just outside the phone box? And I looked and I said, yes. And she said, on the other side of the road, is there a house with a bright yellow front door? And I looked and I said, yes. And she said, does the window of that house have a bright yellow flower box? And I said, yes. And she said, from behind the curtain of that house, <laughs> can you see a little grey-haired old lady waving at you? <laughs> I'm hoping to persuade you that the Bible's language, its actual language, about our eternal destiny is right in front of our noses. It is, if you like, waving to us. If we're slow to see it, it's because sometimes we need to be tipped off where we are. And what I'm hoping to do this afternoon, if you need it, is to give you a tip off. Now, I say we're going to look at Romans 8, 18 to 25, and so we are, but I am going to take a bit of a run-up to get to those verses. First of all, I want to underline the distinction I am making between what the Bible teaches on this subject and what most Christians think it does. And the best way I have found to do that is by asking you if you've got a copy of the Scriptures there with you to look with me at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. If you don't have a copy of the Scriptures... Don't worry, I do. 
this is what the Apostle Peter says about the day of the Lord. This is verse 10, and I'm reading from the NRSV. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You ought to lead lives of holiness and godliness as you wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. Now, I reckon that is how most Christians think of biblical eschatology, a fairly dramatic, apocalyptic vision. It's the passage, I think, which helped to inspire the film The Thief in the Night, which was popular in youth fellowships when I was a teenager, a vision of the earth being consumed in fire. But look at verse 13. So far we've only read to verse 12. And we've stopped at verse 12 because I think most Christians' biblical eschatology finishes at verse 12. Most don't go on to read or at least to take in verse 13. But Peter goes on, in accordance with God's promise, we wait for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. In a nutshell, what I want to say this afternoon is that if your vision of the day of the Lord, if your vision of the coming of the kingdom of God, of where the whole of God's purposes will end, of our ultimate destiny, if your vision does not have room in it for the new creation, for new heavens and a new earth, then your vision is too small. The Bible does not hold out the hope to us of a day when we will go to heaven but of a day when the new earth will come to us. And it is not just to Peter that holds out that hope. You'll find it in Isaiah 66, uh, 65 and 66. And just listen to this from Revelation 21, read at many a funeral service. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. See, I am making all things new. What a fabulously hopeful vision. Death no more. Mourning and crying and pain no more. Every tear wiped away. A vision of all things made new. Not a vision of us going to heaven. A vision of the holy city coming to us from heaven. And if you say, but Pete, that is obviously picture language, not to be taken literally. How can a city be adorned as a bride for her husband? I say, well, of course this is picture language. That's what I mean by saying this is metaphor. But there is real value in holding fast to the metaphors of the Bible and not jettisoning them in favor of the metaphors of a non-Christian Greek philosophy. The metaphors of the Bible are not about us going to heaven or us going anywhere for that matter. They are instead consistently about what is coming to us. They are an embodied hope. And this language of what is coming to us is everywhere. Jesus preached about the coming of the kingdom of God. More than that, he taught his disciples to pray for it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come which is to say your will be done on earth the way that it is already done in heaven. Jesus spoke about the coming of the King of Man, the coming of the Son of Man. The prophets and the apostles looked to the coming of the day of the Lord. The apostles spoke of the coming of Jesus, to a time that is coming, to the hour that is coming. That day of the Lord which is coming when God will be all in all. 
Of course, by now, the Bible students among you are wrapping, racking your brains to think of the scripture passages uh, to which I haven't referred and which are perhaps more compatible with the idea of going to heaven when you die, even if they don't use that term, uh, and which don't fit neatly and comfortably into the picture that I'm painting. You may be thinking of Jesus' promise to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, today you'll be with me in paradise, or to his words to his disciples in John 14, that he was going ahead of them to prepare a place for them. Or you may be thinking of the parable of Dives, the rich man, and Lazarus. Or you may be thinking about Elijah, who was caught up to heaven in a chariot of fire. That's in 2 Kings 2, by the way. Or you may be thinking of the passage in 1 Thessalonians, which speaks of us being caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I think we will have time for questions in about another 20 minutes or so. And if you want to refer to those passages um, to see how they might fit together uh, with the picture I am painting, um, I'm happy to have a go. But let me clarify one more thing. I am not saying that I do not believe in heaven. Heaven is an absolutely central biblical concept. It is the place where God dwells, the place where God's reign is already unobstructed. In heaven, the kingdom of God is already, as it were, fulfilled, already fully and finally implemented. What I'm saying is that heaven, in that closed-up sense, has a built-in sell-by date. We will not go there because it is coming here. The kingdom of God will be the result when heaven bursts upon the earth, when the barrier separating heaven and earth is torn down, when the will of God is done on earth as it is now already done in heaven. The biblical vision of glory of our destiny, in other words, is not of our being transported to heaven, but of heaven breaking in to our world. That is what we are praying for every time we say the Lord's Prayer. I'm happy to come back to any other verses uh, that you may think of as we go along, uh, because I'm truly not trying to pull any wool uh, over your eyes. I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to open the Bible, not close it. In my view, the wool has been pulled over the eyes of Christian people for far too long by non-Christian Platonism, a philosophy which regards the physical world, earth and bodies and matter as transitory and even wicked, and the spiritual world, heaven, and souls as eternal and good, and which regarded salvation as the flight of the soul from this earthly sphere to the realm of the eternal reality. That vision has influenced most of us far more than we realize, and it is at odds with the biblical vision that one day the redeemed people of God will inhabit the new heaven and the new earth. The biblical doctrine of resurrection is a doctrine of bodily resurrection. The prophets looked forward to the day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Jesus himself promised that the meek would inherit the earth. And Paul, in the passage to which we'll turn in a moment, speaks of creation itself, groaning in travail as it waits to be set free from its bondage to decay and to obtain the same glorious liberty as the children of God. And yet we speak lamely about going to heaven when we die. I hope you're with me so far because there is one more piece I want to add to the jigsaw uh, before I turn to the passage from Romans. I want to ask you to consider with me Jesus' resurrection body for a moment. The point is that the resurrection body of Jesus offers us a paradigm of the new heaven and the new earth. It provides a key to help us understand what the consummation of the coming kingdom of God will be like and how it relates to the world we now know. It's like this. The degree of continuity and discontinuity between Jesus' earthly body and his resurrection body is a paradigm of the degree of continuity and discontinuity that there it will be between the present world order and the reality we will know when the kingdom of God has fully come. I'll say that again. The degree of continuity and discontinuity 
between Jesus' earthly body and his resurrection body is a paradigm, a model of the degree of continuity and discontinuity that there will be between the present world order and the reality we will know at the coming of God's kingdom. Take continuity first. The resurrection body of Jesus had real continuity with his earthly body. I don't just mean that it allowed the disciples to recognize him. I mean, for example, that it was physical enough for the risen Jesus to be able to break bread and to invite doubting Thomas to place his hands in his wounds. And in one important passage in Luke 24, when the disciples were frightened that they were seeing a ghost, the risen Jesus said, Why are you troubled? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see that I have. And then to drive the point home, he took a piece of boiled fish and ate it. Those scars had a significance beyond the help that they gave Thomas in recognizing Jesus. They were a kind of visible record of Jesus' history. The risen Lord is the one we crucified. His scars, however, are healed. They don't hurt him anymore, but they don't disappear either. They are taken up into glory because Jesus' resurrection catches up his earthly history. His personal history is not erased in the resurrection. It's glorified. I will be me beyond the grave and you will be you. There will be continuity. I genuinely expect to recognize Abraham and Esther and Mary and Paul when I find myself in glory. I certainly expect to recognize my own dear ones who have died in Christ. And Jesus' resurrection body is my clue. It was definitely a physical body. There was continuity with his earthly body. The point of the empty tomb is that the crucified one is the risen one. It would simply not be possible to set the earthly body of Jesus and the resurrection body side by side. They are the same body. By the same token, there will be continuity, the Bible teaches, not just between the person I am now and the person I will be in God's kingdom, but the way creation is now and the new creation God will make in his kingdom. More continuity, I suspect, than most of us are in the habit of expecting. But the resurrection body of Jesus will also be different from his earthly body. It was different, the resurrection body of Jesus was also different from his earthly body. It was different enough for his risen appearances repeatedly to puzzle his disciples. On that first Easter morning, for example, Mary didn't recognize him in the garden until he used her name. Later on the same day on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples didn't recognize him until he broke the bread. In fact, in that um, intriguing two-verse summary of the Emmaus Road story in Mark chapter 16, the evangelist says they didn't know him because he morphed on them. Go take a look. He changed his shape. And in my favorite story about the risen Lord in John 21, we read how by the Sea of Galilee, even Peter and John didn't recognize him until he helped them get a miraculous catch. Then even after that, as the Lord cooked breakfast for them on the shore, John says they wanted to ask him if, it re if he really was who they thought he was, but didn't dare because they already knew. They wanted to ask him if he really was who they thought he was, but they didn't dare because they already knew. The witness of the Gospels, in any case, is that the risen Jesus could appear and disappear suddenly as if through locked doors. So his resurrection body was clearly not the same as his earthly body. And the discontinuity was not least in the realm of physics. And again, by the same token, there will be discontinuity between the person I am now and the person I will be in God's kingdom. 
but this continuity will be especially over my physical appearance. Thank God. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us we will have resurrection bodies, but he calls them spiritual bodies specifically to contrast them with physical mortal bodies. In the same way, the kingdom of God will not bring the world we know now, but a glorified version, just as the body Jesus has now is a glorified version. The analogy I find most helpful is that of the caterpillar and the butterfly. There is real continuity there. Everything that the caterpillar was is caught up into the butterfly. You can't have the caterpillar and the butterfly side by side. There has to be an empty chrysalis where the caterpillar used to be. But my goodness, and what discontinuity too. They don't look the same, and the butterfly can do all kinds of things that the caterpillar never could. The biggest difference between the world we know now and the world we will know at the coming of God's kingdom, I anticipate will be physical. So we don't have to worry how God will fit the whole redeemed humanity onto the new earth. We're talking precisely about the day when space and time will be invaded by infinity and eternity. Of course it blows our minds and our intellectual capacity, but it is an embodied hope. It is an embodied hope. So finally, if you're still with me, I want to turn to Romans chapter 8 and to verses 18 to 25. Some of you may have read these verses a hundred times without quite taking in what they say about an embodied hope. But Paul was a good Hebrew theologian. He knew biblical eschatology. He knew what the prophets taught about the consummation of God's purposes. And in the light of Jesus' resurrection, he built on it. And he said this. This is verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. You'll notice that Paul takes present suffering for granted, but regards it as nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed. So embodied hope is not an exemption from trouble now, I'm sorry to say. Just look at my email box any day of the week. But then look at verse 19. Creation, he says, is waiting with eager longing for the children of God to be revealed. It's a lovely verse in which Paul says that the identity and status of the children of God is already fixed. But for the moment, our identity and status are hidden somehow, veiled, so that the cosmos does not know us for who we are. But one day it will. And meanwhile, the apostle says, the whole creation is, as it were, straining on tiptoe, looking and longing for the day when these things will be revealed. The picture is of the way a lover might strain on tiptoe on a crowded railway station platform to catch a first sight of the beloved getting off the train. What's surprising is for Paul to say that it is creation which is doing this waiting, creation, which is longing to see the children of God revealed. He doesn't say it's the angels or the hosts of heaven. He doesn't invite us to picture Gabriel peering over the heavenly gallery with a crowd of the cherubim, seraphim and the cherubim to see the children of God enter into their liberty. Creation is doing it. Why? Well, this is verse 21. Because on that day, when the children of God are revealed, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. And it will obtain the same glorious freedom of the children of God. That's breathtaking. And that is our hope. That's how big our doctrine of redemption can be. If you think salvation is just for us human beings, your view of God is too small. That is the first problem with the I am going to heaven when I die school of thought. It reduces God's saving purpose to me and my relationship with him. 
Now, it goes without saying that the human race is the object of the redemption Jesus won in a special sense, just as in Genesis 1, it is clear we human beings were the crown of God's wonderful creation in a special sense. But we were not the only thing God made. When he made the stars, he knew it was good. When he made the trees and the flowers, he knew it was good. When he made the fish and the birds and the animals, he knew it was good. We are not the sole beneficiaries of God's redemption any more than we were the sole beneficiaries of his creation. But just as human beings played a pivotal role in the fall, throwing creation into chaos and dislocation, so we play a pivotal role in redemption. And all creation is straining on tiptoe to watch us do it. There can be no liberation for creation as a whole unless the liberty, the redemption that God has in store for his children, his human creation, is first revealed. Then Paul goes on. We know that all creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Why has it? With what is creation pregnant? What is creation going to give birth to? When Kathy, my wife, was first pregnant and the time for her labor was near, she had a nightmare in which she gave birth to an egg and bacon flan. <laughs> it was a nightmare because a human being expects to give birth to a human being. A child is flesh of the mother's flesh, blood of her blood. There is continuity there. But the child is not the same as the mother. The child is a new human. There's the discontinuity. So it is with creation. It is in labor, the apostle says, and it will give birth to a new creation. The new creation will not be the same as the old any more than the child is the same as the mother, but it will be earth of this earth and heaven of this heaven. And then verse 23. It's not only creation which is groaning. We too are groaning. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's what we already have as a down payment which gives us hope of its fulfillment. We have the Spirit to light up fires of hope in our hearts. But as those who have the Spirit, we are groaning because we are waiting for our adoption. We are waiting for God to complete the good work that he has begun in us, namely the redemption of our bodies. So this is the second problem with the I am going to heaven school of salvation. It reduces salvation to a salvation of souls. It looks forward to a day when the human soul will be released from the body to float up to be with God in heaven. But the biblical vision is so much more robust than that. A vision of a resurrection of the body bound up in the transformation of the cosmos. I'm nearly done. I will sum up and then shut up. In the Diocese of Southall and Nottingham, there is a group of parishes who some years ago invented what I still regard as the best strap line in the Church of England. Um, the six parishes which make up a group ministry um, uh, have uh, coined for themselves uh, the group name, the Cranmer Group, uh, because the illustrious Archbishop was born in one of the six villages uh, that make up the group. And the strap line is made up of the initial letters of each of the six villages that make up the Cranmer group. With me so far? So the six villages are Scarrington, Austin, Watton, Hawksworth, Aslockton, Thoroton. And the strapline is the Cranmer group, so what? It's genius. Every Christian institution should ask itself that question almost daily. The Diocese of Blackburn, so what? The Mystery of Faith, so what? 
a focus for a year on discipleship, so what? The Diocese of Sheffield, so what? A fully biblical vision of the coming of God's kingdom and an embodied hope, yeah, so what? Well, I want to leave you with a quotation from a favourite theologian of mine, a man called Leslie Newbigin. You see, if our hope of the renewal of the entire cosmos is a real hope, the question is what part are we called to play uh, and what difference will it make to the way in which we lead our lives as followers of the Lord Jesus? To put the same question in more ordinary terms, what is the relationship of the church to the coming kingdom of God? Um, here's Newbegin's response, um, which offers the, the best statement of that relationship uh, I've ever come across. The church, he said, and every local congregation of the church is intended by God to be a sign, an agent, and a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. Every word in that definition is important. These are still his words. It is called to be a sign pointing beyond itself to the coming of God's kingdom. It is called to be an agent, a means through which God's will is done in the world and his reign becomes effective. And the church is called to be the first fruits where a foretaste of the kingdom can be enjoyed now. And then he goes on, therefore, the key question which is to be asked of the church and of every local congregation of the church is not how rich is it, how big is it, or even how fast is it growing. It is what difference is it making to that part of the world in which it is placed. Is it actually functioning as a first fruit, a sign, and an instrument of God's new creation in that part of the world? And here's my last point. I think that everything New Begin says there about the local church is actually true of every individual disciple too. Even as an individual, even as a solitary follower of Jesus, as a baptised member of the people of God, you and every single member of the congregations to which you belong are a sign and an agent and a foretaste of the kingdom of God. You're a sign pointing beyond yourself to God's coming kingdom. You are an agent through whom the rule of God is made more fully manifest on earth. And you are a foretaste in whom the values of the kingdom are already visible on earth. Any discipleship worthy of the name will make a difference in the world. And disciples who are intent on making a difference in the world will need to be sustained through thick and thin. And the only thing that will sustain them in the spirit is the resurrection hope of Jesus, which is an embodied hope. Thank you.